Good morning. Thank you for being with me again this week. I've been talking about mankind, and today we're going to discuss the future of mankind. First of all, what is the future of mankind? Let's face it, there are two things. First of all, where we finish as individuals, and secondly, the fact that one day the Lord our God is going to take this age, and He's just going to roll it up and finish with it. The day is coming. We don't know if it's in yet this generation. We don't know when it will be. But the day is coming when the Lord will say, that's enough. I've seen enough. And it's going to end. How? I believe the Lord Jesus Christ will return. I believe this age as we know it will just be completely stopped. Yes, it may be with a big bang. We don't know exactly. But we can know then when that happens, there will be a new heaven and a new earth which will be inhabited by God's faithful people and no one else. Satan will be gone. Every unbeliever will be gone. It will be a total change and a total renewal by the Lord our God. But that's not exactly what I want to zero in on. I want to talk about you. And uh, just by the way about me. What lies ahead for us after our life? First of all, can we know? Do we know? Are we certain? Yes, I think we are. I think the Bible is very clear. The Bible tells us there are two ways a man can go. Either to life or to death, eternal life or eternal death. Listen to the way Jesus puts it. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I shared with you one time that my father-in-law was very, very ill. He had had his bladder removed because of cancer. He had slipped and fallen in the hospital and had a broken hip. And he began to be delirious. In the middle of this, he had all sorts of weird dreams. But he told my wife that at one point, he didn't just have a dream. He had a vision. And he believed it was very real. He saw what I've just read to you. And he was on the path of destruction. And he said there were masses of people just pushing him along, pushing him along. And suddenly over to the right he heard a voice. And over there there was sunshine, green fields, and in the middle a man who he met here in the church where I worked. And he was calling to Pop to come over and join him. And Father couldn't get through the crowd and he had to push and push. And he said, I knew if I didn't get out of that broad road, I was going to die. And we believe with all our hearts that was a conversion experience. Totally different from mine, probably totally different from yours. But here was a man who had a dramatic experience, even in a vision. And he knew that at that moment he moved from death to life. Have you? Are you on that broad way? Let me tell you, most people are. Jesus said it. Because there are few that find that narrow way that leads to life. Why? Because of our soulish nature. We don't want to do what God wants to do. We want to do what we want to do. And we battle that like anything. Now, if you turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.17, we find the results of salvation. And what do we read? Therefore, if anyone is in Jesus Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. How's it going? Is the newness beginning to show through? Is it beginning to make sense to other people? Is your life in Jesus Christ attractive? These are all facts if you've truly been saved. You have a new life in Him. But I don't think it finishes there. You say, how can I obtain this salvation? Well, I think there are a number of ways. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Here's Peter speaking before the Sanhedrin, and he comes out with a classic statement. Let me read to you. He said, 4 verse 12. Let's get it absolutely right. One of my friends said, by the way, Richard, when you're turning your pages, I can hear you. Well, how on earth I'm to turn the pages of a Bible without you hearing me, I'm not sure. 
Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It is only in the name of Jesus. And when I accept Jesus Christ and He comes into my life, I'm saved. Luke chapter 15, verse 32. And by the way, we must just expand on these verses a little bit. These give us the meat. It says there in the parable of the prodigal son. 15, verse 32. And it's the Father speaking. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's right. That's why each one of us needs salvation. Until you find Jesus Christ, you are dead. Spiritually, you're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sins. And when you find Jesus Christ, your spirit comes alive unto God. We talked about the spirit on Wednesday. It comes alive unto God. And from then on, it's living in God and God's living in your spirit. What a change. He was lost and is found. He was dead and is alive again. The contrast. And that's true for every one of us who's been saved. Now, once I've accepted Jesus Christ, I show I've accepted Him by a change of life. And friend, that needs effort. You can't just say it. You've got to do it. Old habits have to go. A new way of life begins. That's the difference between the soulish person and the spiritual person. I've got to get rid of my soulish ways, and it doesn't happen overnight. First of all, friend, you didn't take overnight to get the way you were before you were saved. So it takes time, and it takes brokenness, and it takes us opening up to the Lord our God in every way, being sensitive to what He's showing us, putting things right with others where things have gone wrong. All sorts of different things God does in our lives once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But maybe there's a little bit more. What's my future after death? Well, it's with Jesus. You say, well, how can you be so sure? Two ways. First of all, Jesus Christ himself rose from the dead. He is eternal. Now Jesus lives in you and Jesus lives in me. So he who is eternal lives in us and that makes us eternal. He dwells in our spirit. So our spirit that was dead has come alive. Our spirit that was headed for eternal death has now headed for eternal life because the eternal Jesus is living there. Isn't that fantastic? That's the fact of salvation. There's so much more than that, but that's where it takes us. There are a couple of awful things we might just think about here. Every one of us on this earth is on one road or the other. We're either on the road to destruction or we're on the road to life. As you drive into the city this morning, you're not on Broad Street, you're not on I-95, you're not on the Schuylkill, you're on a road to life or death. Which one are you on? Have you made that switch? Have you been to the cross of Jesus Christ? Have you said to Him, Lord, I ask you to forgive my sins, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, and maybe you've got to name those sins to Him, have you done that? If so, then you've switched from that road and you're on the road to life. In this brief life, however long it is, however short it is, we decide our eternal destiny. That always blows my mind. We may be here 20, 30, 60, 80 years, and in that brief span of time, we decide where we're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's a long time, friend. There are only two ways. For the first time, Gallup polls can't come into it. We can't have a section of people who don't know. It's either eternal life or it's eternal death. Now, let's come back to those of us who've accepted Jesus Christ. If you haven't, friend, there's only one thing for you to do. That's to accept the Lord and to do it now. You can't wait the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the time of salvation. And if you wait, it may be too late. But what about those of us who are saved? What else is there? Well, let's come back to what I shared Wednesday. First of all, we need to become spiritual people. And we're not when we're saved. Our spirit comes alive under God. But there's so much more. 
There's the will, the emotions, the mind. And isn't it true? We're in a generation when they say, you've got to feel good. You do things to make yourself feel good. God says, you've got to do things that make me feel good. Do what you want to do. This is situational ethics, you see. That's the whole philosophy of the humanist. That is not biblical. I have got to have my will in total and sub complete submission to the Lord my God if he's to be my Lord. And I've got to say, Lord, thy will be done in Richard. I don't care what it is. And that's the big one. I don't care what it is, so long as it's what you want. And when I can say that from the heart, he can begin to work in me. And I said, begin. I didn't say the ball game's over. I think it's just begun. And it's not all going to be easy. And there are going to be times when we hurt. But remember, the Lord never gives us more than we can bear. He puts the heat on a little bit this way and that way because he's trying to melt us into what he wants us to be. We're just like clay in the potter's hands. We sing a little chorus that says, Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. The trouble is we only last, like the last bit. We're not keen on the breaking and not too much on the melting. The molding isn't too bad, but we really want to be filled. But there's steps here, you see. God can't fill us until he's broken us. And that's a big step. Also, our whole mind has to be taken over by the Lord. On a number of different occasions, we've talked about the mind because it's so vital. What you think is what you become. We looked at this on Tuesday. Now, where is your head? Are your thoughts controlled by Jesus Christ or are they controlled by you? Now, quite obviously, in your work, in the busyness of the day, you can't consciously bring the Lord in. But it's surprising how much you can. If you just say, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, control my thinking. Control my thinking, Lord. Just say it consciously, consciously, until finally it becomes part of you. And you begin to take on the mind of Jesus Christ. You begin to think the way he thought. You begin to think that his thoughts and not your thoughts. Then you're becoming that broken person. You're becoming that spiritual person. And as you do, you'll begin to move into a maturity. And God will use you in a way he's never used you before. Because he's been waiting to break you. And you've been slithering away and say, Lord, hold it. Your whole person is being prepared for heaven. 